Titus chapter number one. We're going to con- we're going to continue down through through this passage, and uh, go through the book of Titus. Titus chapter one, verse number one. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth of which is after godliness and hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of, the everlasting, of, of, of God our Savior, to Titus, mine own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Now, that's, a, that's a, a rather long preamble to the introduction of the book, where you, the address of the book, when he says to Titus in verse number 4. And what he's doing there, and I take it that he does that because he says in verse 4, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith. And he's just told you what the common faith is. There is this understanding, this faith, this doctrine, this truth that's been revealed through the ministry of the Apostle Paul that is Uh, designed to be the common faith of the believers today. In other words, now we have the fullness of the revelation of God's Word and God's plan and purpose, and that should be the faith held by everyone and and, and, uh, shared by by everyone. That's why it says in verse 1 that his apostleship, he's a servant of God and an apostle. And his apostleship is according to the faith, the doctrine of God's elect. Here's the doctrine for the, for the church, the body of Christ, and it, com- it comes through Paul's apostleship. And it's the acknowledging the truth that is after godliness. If you're going to have godlikeness, if you're going to have godliness today, it's going to be based on the truth that comes to you through the ministry of the apostle Paul. And then he takes a little, so I don't want to call it a diversion, but sort of a little sidestep and talks about that doctrine that's according to godliness, this, this truth of, uh, of the faith of God's elect, this ministry committed to him through his apostleship. And he says in verse number two, in hope of eternal life. When he says in hope, it's not, you know, we just sang that song, I know in whom I have believed. Do, do you know where that song came from? I, I know that was Ron's favorite song. But uh, that, do you know the verse that that song comes out of? It's 2 Timothy chapter 1. I know in whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That's 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 12. Paul says, For this cause I have also suffered these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know in whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Now that's not a verse talking simply about getting saved. And uh, that, that's a verse talking about the fact that we, when I look at my sufferings, Paul says, and I see the things that have happened to me and fallen out to me, the afflictions of the gospel that have come to me because of the, of, of the, of the preaching that I'm doing, I'm, I've got a confidence. I'm not ashamed of all that stuff. I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him. What did Paul commit to him? He committed himself to him, and he's able to keep that, that against that day. He then tells Timothy, hold fast the, fa- the, s- the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing which is committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Uh, he, Paul says, I know the one I'm serving. I've committed my life, my, my well-being, myself to him. That verse we're looking at in Psalm 4 this morning about, uh, you know, it's in the Lord that we have safety. It's in the Lord that our well-being is. Well, Paul said, I know, in spite of all this stuff that's happened to me, that I know whom I'm trusting. I know who he is. And I know what he's committed to me. And Tim, I know what he's committed to you through me. Well, when he says over here in Titus, in hope of eternal life, that's not, you know, I, I wish it took place. Or maybe it will, maybe it won't. That's a, here's the foundation. Something that's in something that's founded the message Paul's preaching is founded in the hope, in the plan, in what the prospect, the sure, I know whom I have believed, this sure, confident expectation of eternal life. There's something that God is doing when he says eternal life. Uh, come with me to Ephesians chapter 3. When you think of eternal life, you usually think of life that never ends going forward. But eternity would be something that goes backwards too. In hope of eternal life, Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 7. 
Ephesians 3, 7, wherefore, whereof, rather, uh, talking about the gospel in verse 6, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of, Christ, of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles <clears throat> the unsearchable riches of Christ, and make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, <coughs> excuse me, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now, under the principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, watch, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, if there is an eternal purpose, that eternal purpose would have to do with, with things that took place before the world began. The world begins here. It would be a purpose that came from eternity past in, 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 in respect to time. And it would, look, it would look forward to eternity future out here with the carrying on. So this plan that Paul's talking about in here that's revealed to him, he calls it the, the, the secret, the mystery, has to do with the forming of the church, the body of Christ, of course. That program in hope of eternal life. In, there, here's something back here that God planned that's manifested today that has to do with what he's going to do with us out here in the future. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised, again, before the world began. And my point to you is that the eternal life back here has to do with more than just the fact that we're going to live forever. There is a plan that the Father had back here before the foundation of the world. That plan is what's going to be carried out through all eternity future. In hope, the foundation of everything that, that, that we do, that Paul does, it's all based on, on the, the plan that was devised by the Father before the world began. In hope of eternal promise. Come back with me to Ephesians chapter 1. You know, we ask the question often, when you make a promise, you have to make it to somebody. So I said, well, I promise myself. Well, you are somebody. But in the Godhead back here, there's God the Father, there's God the Son, and there's God the Holy Spirit. They are three people. They're one God, but they are three people. Just like I'm, I'm a person, you're a person, there's a whole bunch of people in the room here. We're all people, equally people, equally human, but we're separate and distinct per persons. In the Godhead, the essence of God, the essence of what we would call, um, for us, our humanity is the same, equal. They are equally God in essence and being, but they are three distinct persons. It's not the modalism where at one point God functions as a father, and at another point he functions as the son, and at another point he functions as the Holy Spirit. That's a denial of the Trinity. That's the, the oneness doctrine, oneness Pentecostalism. Guys like T.D. Jakes, by the way, that's what they teach. Uh, if you see oneness Pentecostals, that's, that's that doctrine. There's a lot of them out there. That's why, by the way, that uh, <laughs> fellow was arguing with me recently about a, a, a Muslim, and he says, well, you know, the Quran doesn't make any mistakes. It's perfect. And I said, well, I can show you a mistake in the Quran." He said, oh, okay, you know, show me. Well, you know, somebody says a mistake in the Bible. I say, show me. So I, should, I, I don't know what it is off the top of my finger, but I, I ask him, what does the Quran teach about the Christian God? Oh, you believe in three gods. How do you know? And he literally went and quoted me the passage in the Quran. He quoted it for me. <laughs> and I said, well, see, that's a mistake. Because Christians, Christian Orthodox historic Christianity, whatever that is, don't believe in three gods. They believe in one God who exists in three persons, not three gods. There's only one essence in being of deity. Well, why would Muhammad have said that? Because he was raised around some Christians who had a deviant view of the Trinity. And all he knew was what the, the Nestorians, what, all he knew was their deviant, their, their uh, messed up view of, of the Godhead. And so he incorporated that into his writings because that's what he thought, well, if he's wrong, he's wrong. 
Okay? So there's a lot of different ideas, but the Godhead is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're the three, they are the three individuals who existed before God, the, uh, the creation of all things, and they had a plan in creation. They didn't just send, he didn't just send the Lord Jesus Christ out to, to create all things, just, you know, go out and see what had happened. I was in, uh, <laughs> I was in an art display recently where some artists had their stuff on display, and uh, I'm looking at one of these things, and I'm thinking, that must have just happened. <laughs> there was no rhyme or reason to it. You know, we had the ladies here a couple of uh, a month or two ago doing the, the art thing with Sandy, and I don't know if you've seen the paintings that they did, but some of them are really spectacular, really good. But they all had a plan to them. They didn't just, you know, throw it against the wall. Well, God in creation didn't just throw it against the wall, see what would happen. He had a plan. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 9. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number, number 9. Start back, actually go back to verse 3. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So you and I have been blessed with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him, notice, before the foundation of the world. So this, these blessings that you and I experience today and have and possess in Christ, these all spiritual blessings that are ours, are according to something he, where he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. So these things here had their origin back over here, according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. So the things that are involved in our ministry, in our lives spiritually, is something that God planned before the world began. Verse number five, well, verse number four, according as he had chosen us in him before the world began, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and, be, and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ according to himself, uh, to, the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now notice what that's talking about because the issue of adoption is a fascinating thing to me. It's like Trinity. It's, it's amazing how, how confusing you see people carelessly use these words. Uh, he's chosen us in him. So where did he choose you? In Christ. How do you get into Christ? By the way, before you got in Christ, were you an Adam? Have you always been in Christ? No, you were in Adam. You were lost. So choosing you in Christ means it has to do with the time of your salvation. He's chosen these people who are in Christ. Who does he choose to put in Christ? 1 Corinthians 1, verse 22, Paul says in the, 1 Corinthians 1, 21, For in, in the wisdom of God, when the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the preaching of the cross to save them that believe. So Alex is teaching on uh, Calvinism in the morning. And if you want to have a verse that gets you beyond all that kind of nonsense, a verse like 1 Corinthians 1, 21 will do it for you because the sovereign free will of God, they talk about the eternal counsel and the eternal decrees and, and all that stuff back here. Listen, and that's what these verses are talking about. But what God planned to do was form the body of Christ and according, it pleased God to form that body of believers out of those who trust the gospel of grace. So when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, the one who died and was buried and raised again for you, when you trust him to be the Savior that he died and rose again for you to be, God puts you into the church, the body of Christ. And in that body of believers, he has predestinated you. Now that's an easy word to understand. You see the word destinate, destiny. Pre is before. He beforehand determine the destiny of that body of believers. He's got a plan and a purpose for you out here in the future that he predetermined you would go there. He predetermined it back here. You trust Christ, you, get a, you become a part of that predetermined plan, and your destiny is fixed, no question about it. 
Alex was talking about that this morning, uh, about the, the issue of perseverance and preservation, that kind of thing. Listen, God planned it. God does this, and he already prefixed the, des the destination when you trusted in Christ. Now, he predestinated you to the adoption of children. Adoption is not getting saved. Adoption is not being placed into the family of God. Galatians chapter 4 tells you what adoption is. If you look, you just turn two pages back there to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4, Now I say that an heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, when we were children, we were under bondage under the elements of the law, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, where we, where we cry, Abba, Father. So here's someone who is already an heir. You're already in the family. You're already a child. You've already been born of God and you're in God's family. And now when the time, a proper time comes, you're going to be adopted. Ephesians says it's the adoption of children. God, uh, the word adopt, the idea of sonship is the idea of being an adult. You're under tutors and governors until the time that the father says, now you're an adult. Now I'm going to put you on the board. I'm going to put you out in public. I'm going to say, there's my adult son. He's in charge of the business. Now that event, come with me to Romans chapter 8, takes place at a specific time appointed of the Father. I've teased my kids through the years, said, you know, we have to have our Galatians 4 conversation where I appoint you, <laughs> I, I declare you to be an adult. One of my boys said, well, when I turn 18, I'm going to be an adult. I said, no, you'll, you'll be an adult when I tell you you are. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to be 18. <laughs> You're not going to be there then. So anyway, adoption is, is, ha is being, the idea is, the, the word means to be placed into something. You, uh, the legislator adopts a law. They place it into a relationship. You adopt a child into your family. You place them into a relationship. But in the scripture, adoption isn't you taking somebody from somebody else's family and putting it in yours. It's taking someone who is in your family, one of your children, and then putting them in the relationship and saying, they are now adults. Now, when you got into Christ, he, according to this thing he planned before the foundation of the world, he put you into Christ, and there he predestinated you to be placed into the position of full-grown sonship. Now, the adoption of children, God desires his children to become adults. Notice when the time appointed of the Father for this to happen is. Romans 8, verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. But not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. To wit, what? The redemption of our body. When does the redemption of your body take place? Jesus Christ comes back. The dead in Christ rise first. We which are alive and remain are caught up together to meet them right there. The adoption is, is the redemption of your body. The resurrection, the, 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 the rapture, is called the day of redemption. In Ephesians twice. At the day of redemption, you get your spirit is, is regenerated now, your soul is saved, and at the resurrection, your body, you get your glorified body, and you are literally placed into a completed status as a, as a full grown adult in the family of God. The adoption takes place right there at the rapture. That's why he says you and I have the spirit of adoption. If you're in Romans 8, still look back at verse 14. 
For as many as of us are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. The Holy Spirit's presence in your life is the, is the, the spiritual, gives you the spiritual capacity to cry, Abba, Father. In other words, you have the ability, <coughs> excuse me, it's got to be the chalk. You have the capacity by the Spirit of God in your life right now to bring into your experience the status of full-grown sonship. Romans 6.13, he says, You now can yield your members as instruments unto, right, unto, uh, unto God as those that are alive from the dead. You aren't alive from the dead yet that way, but you literally can take your members and yield them to God with that victory. You can present your body a living sacrifice. And when you do that, your inner man is doing the living. Well, you have the capacity to, it, to grow in that sonship understanding. But the adoption takes place right here. That's why when you hear all, these, all this stuff going on around about, about sonship status and sonship edification and adoption stuff and all that stuff, and I, I talk with these folks and I ask them, so what is the, and they look at, a, at the adoption as something that's taking place back in here based on, on your growth, but the verses don't say that. The verse says there's the adoption. And you've been predestinated to this adoption that is placing as in the status of a son. That's what he wants to do with the body of Christ. He's going to put us in these positions of, of sonship activity that, he has, that he's forming the body of Christ for. All of that is based on the plan that he had before the world began. Now go back to Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 5, having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of of his will. Well, that good pleasure of his will, he explains down in verse number 9. Having, well, verse 8, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his, and that's God the Father's, will, according to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself. Well, that's that good pleasure of his will. He's got a plan. He has a purpose that he purposed in himself. That is, that's the promise that he made before the world began. Now, of course, the question is, how would you, how, what would that be about? Well, there's three people back here before the world began. There's the Father, there's the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they obviously all entered in to an understanding and an agreement to a plan that the Father has. Now, verse 10 tells you what it is. That in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, whether they're both which are in heaven and on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him that worketh all things after the counsel of his own will that we should be the praise of the glory of His grace who first trusted Christ. Here's this plan that He has. We are in it here today, the body of Christ. We've received an inheritance out here. That's what that sonship thing is about. The heir, the, though He be uh, the child, though He be heir of all, doesn't get it until the time of the appointment of the Father. So it's important to understand what the original plan was, and that's what verse 10 is about that in the dispensation of the fullness of time. Now, that expression, people argue about what that passage is about. The fullness of time, uh, that's an expression. The fullness of something is when, when whatever it is is brought to completion. When you fulfill Scripture, you bring it to completion. You don't do away with it. You bring, you, its purpose is brought, brought to pass. For what purpose did God create time? Well, he tells you. 
that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, in the when we were when you arrive at an understanding of what it is that God created time to accomplish, what's going to happen? He's going to gather all things in Christ. Now, if the purpose for creating everything, you remember Revelations, it says all things were created by Him and for Him. Colossians 1 says that. And without Him was not anything created that was made, John says. He created everything, but He didn't just create it, He created it for Him. He created it so that the Lord Jesus Christ could be the head of it all and that it could all center in Him. Now, we talk a lot about the fact that He created all things in the heaven and all things in the earth. He creates things in the earth. He reveals those things in the earth in what the Bible calls prophecy, that which has been spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began, not before it, but since it. This stuff has been made known from the foundation of the world. That's what prophecy is about. And it has to do with God's plan and purpose through the nation Israel. And that comes up here. When you come to Paul, things change. Now you have the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, the secret, which was kept secret since the world began. And you're part of a plan that was chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Titus is going to say that that promise of eternal life has been made manifest through preaching committed to Paul. So all this information back here is only about us, is revealed here. Israel's program is revealed all through the Scripture. We make a lot about that issue of heaven. In the beginning, God created the heaven. That's our sphere. The earth is Israel's sphere. You have the body for this and, and it, that for that. There's one purpose, to make Jesus Christ the head of it all. Now, it's going to happen in two spheres, the earth and the heavens, with two agencies, Israel and the body of Christ, with two operating systems, law and grace, two methods of revelation, prophecy, mystery. So all those distinctions were there. And if you don't see them, then you, 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 you confuse them. What I want you to see is, is that even with all those distinctions, there is a fundamental unity. There's a fundamental purpose. One purpose. Verse, verse 10, Ephesians 1, 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and on earth, even in him in whom we've obtained an inheritance. So there's one purpose, and that is to make Jesus Christ the head over all things. Now the things, you go down to verse 20 and 21 and 22, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, all the things he's talking about there are the governments in the heavens and the governments in the earth. God didn't just create a universe without a ruling system to accomplish his business in the universe. He put creatures there. Uh, in order to do those things. So there's a whole governmental system. The, the heavens and the earth are organized. They're populated. They're, they're purposed and so forth. But the whole, whole plan behind it all is that Jesus Christ would be the head of all things. That he'd gather them together in one. And to me, the great illustration of that is the body of Christ. Because what happens in the body of Christ is you take two divinely designed divergent groups, Israel and the Gentiles. Now, in chapter 2 of Ephesians, verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. God himself made a distinction between the circumcision and the uncircumcision, Israel and the Gentiles, and he made a physical distinction, a racial distinction, a social distinction, a spiritual distinction, a religious distinction. He made it. 
Verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ being aliens in the, from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. So when you see a distinction between the Jew and the Gentile, that's a distinction God himself made. He ordained it. He established it. He put a middle wall of partition between the two groups. He made a distinction between the heaven and the earth. You go back to Genesis 1 and you'll see that he made, he made this firmament and he called it heaven. Then he put the earth in that firmament. Well, the earth is in that firmament. And he calls with the atmosphere around the earth the open firmament. Well, if, if you're in the open firmament, what would you call the firmament, the, or the rest of the firmament? Closed, not open. <laughs> That's why Psalm 115 says that the heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth belongs to man. He made man out of the earth, earthy. He limited man's sphere of operation to the earth. So you have an earthly creation and an earthly man sent out to reclaim the earth. Very clear. There's also that heavenly creation. Now you have the body of Christ that will be equipped. First man is with the earth earthly. Second man is the Lord from heaven. We've sown a natural body. We've raised a spiritual body. You're sown in a body that you can get along here. You're going to be raised in a body that will get along up there. That distinction. The body of Christ, you have those two diverse, completely separated by God groups of people, Jew and Gentile. He puts you together in the body of Christ, and he says, now you're one. You have one head, Jesus Christ. And no matter who you are, bond or free, male or female, Jew or Gentile, you have one controlling life, and that's the life of Christ. And he operates the body. He's the head. And, you know, I've, I've talked to you about your body being a, a picture your body is a temple. Your body has the structure of your body. There's a parallel between the structure of your body and the structure of God's Word. And just like commands come from your head, down your nervous system, down your spine, there are 33 bones in your spine. Each one of them has nerves in it that come out and go sideways like that to, to populate your body. And you have those 33 with the two, that's 66, and you say, well, wait a minute, I'm beginning to see some parallels here. And I'm not going to get into that tonight, but how God controls your body physically is a picture of how he's going to control the universe with his word. And what happens is that oneness that the body of Christ has is a picture, listen, in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he's going to gather together all the positions in heaven and on earth, all of creation, the believers in all of creation, under one head. And if you can understand how the body of Christ can function as one, under one head, then you can begin to understand how the, the oneness, the functioning of, of, of creation in the new creation how it can function as a single unit under one head. God's original purpose, his ultimate plan, is for that headship of Jesus Christ to exercise over these things. And out here, the oneness, you're always going to be the body of Christ. Israel's always going to be Israel. But we will be accomplishing that one plan of the Father. He's not accomplishing both of them today. He's only accomplishing the forming of the body of Christ today. In that day, he'll have both agencies. So come back with me to Titus, chapter 1. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. The hope of eternal life, which God, everything is built on the fact that the Father has this plan in eternity past to make his Son the head of everything in creation, everything in the earth through Israel, everything in the heavens through the body of Christ, that one plan, and you've been made a part through the ministry of Paul, committed to Paul, of that plan and that promise, that purpose. 
Now that plan in due time, verse 3, in due times was manifested His Word through preaching committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Now in this crowd I don't need to go over that passage a lot. You understand there's a, the distinctive ministry of the Apostle Paul. This information here that we're involved in today in Paul's epistles in Romans to Philemon is not found in time past back here. I was looking at a thing the other day. A real popular it has become real popular to be to deny the pre-trib rapture. And I'm watching people deny the pre-trib rapture, and they always go back to the book of Matthew. And they go back to the, to, to the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. Years ago, one of our brothers, we were out at camp, at, at Brother John's camp at, uh, in California. We were up at Idlewild. And uh, there were five or six of us preachers sitting there. And this one brother, he says, you know, I'm, I'm wondering whether or not the rapture is really pre-trib. And this brother, had been a, he'd been a denominational preacher in the past, Acts 2 guy. And so I asked him, I said, well, tell me, why did you ever believe in a pre-trib rapture? And he said, well, and he got his Bible out and found a note page and he had 10 reasons. <laughs> and we went down through those 10 reasons. The first one was, well, the, the church isn't mentioned after Revelation chapter 4. Okay, scratch that one because the body of Christ isn't in Revelation at all. So that, whatever, whatever happened in the Revelation is not us. And then Matt, every, he went through the 10, and by the time he got through, he said, I didn't have much of a reason to be pre-trib to start with, did I? And we all agreed, no, you didn't. Because if you don't understand the distinctive ministry of the Apostle Paul that Christ committed to Paul and that that's the source of our doctrine for today, then you're not going to be pre-trib. You can't be. Because the doctrine in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the early Acts period, Hebrews, Revelation, is not you're going to not be here during the seventh week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble. It's that you are. And that it's going to be after the tribulation of those days that Christ comes back and delivers you. Well, the reason for that is, is they don't see that our ministry wasn't manifested back there. If you, if you don't just get that little twist of the lens right there, you're sunk. By the way, the fundamental, the two most fundamental components of dispensational Bible study, one is what, what's called the literal method of, of reading the Bible. You just let the Bible have the natural sense. You don't read Jerusalem and say it's your hometown. If you read Jerusalem, you say, it's on a map, it's in Jerusalem. You don't spiritualize it. You read it, just give it its natural meaning. The second is the distinction between Israel and the body of Christ. And if you don't see the distinction, the division between Israel and the body of Christ, between prophecy and mystery, if you don't get that, you're never going to understand your Bible. You might as well hang it up and just go do, go fishing. And I can recommend some guys that can help you catch fish. But you, you, you'll do better catching fish than you will studying your Bible if you don't recognize those two basic fundamental principles and approaches. To be a dispensationalist means that you study the Bible literally and naturally and that you make that distinction between Israel and the body of Christ. And that's what the body of Christ between Prophecy and mystery, and that's what's being talked about in verse 3. That in due times he might manifest his word through preaching committed unto me. That's why Paul's in the Bible. And you don't need me to go through all the verses about it. You all know them better than I do. But that distinction is critical. Verse number 1, he says, that Acknowledging the truth which is after godliness. Any teaching that... that, that fails to follow the understanding of the distinctive ministry of Paul is a teaching that promotes ungodliness. Okay? Now that's slow pitch, waist high, right across the plate where anybody can read the, 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 the name on the ball. If you don't understand God's Word rightly divided, you don't recognize the distinctive ministry of Paul, what you're teaching is going to lead to ungodliness. Let me show you. Go back to 2 Timothy. 
chapter 2, verse 14. These things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. You can be teaching the Bible and subverting the hearers. What does that mean? Well, at the end of verse 18, he says, they overthrow the faith of some. Verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings. That would be anything that doesn't do what verse 15 says to do. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. Now when you get more ungodliness, that means you already had some. So those profane and vain babblings that teaching that wasn't rightly dividing the word to start with is only going to produce more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker. It's a slow, internal destruction of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. They send them back over into Israel's program. Titus 1. In hope of eternal life, it's God, oh, Titus 1, verse, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and according to the truth, which is after godliness. If you want to pursue godlikeness, you have to acknowledge this truth that comes to you through the faith, the, the faith of God's elect that comes through you through Paul's apostleship. It's founded, it's in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested His word through preaching committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Paul's apostleship was in accordance with God's commandment. That's the reason he can write in 1 Corinthians 14, if a man seem to be spiritual, think himself to be spiritual, a prophet, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. It's that, ser it's that serious. It's that simple. Now somebody says, well, you guys have a little handful of people. Everybody else has got multitudes. And I remind you how many people did Noah have on the ark? Who had the majority? Well, the majority vote is not how this is determined is determined by studying God's Word rightly divided. It's not even determined by studying God's Word. It's determined by studying God's Word rightly divided. And that's critical. Brother Lou was telling me this morning that last weekend, he and Mary and their kids, uh, the girl, the twins, they, they went to see Noah's Ark at the Creation Museum. And he was showing me pictures of it. And they had a great time, and he showed all the pictures and stuff of it. But he said, he said, I stood there and laughed my head off. Now, you know how Lou is. He, 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 he sees something funny. He laughs. He laughs all over. And what he was laughing at is they had this, this uh, wall. The Word of God is the infallible, inspired Word of God. And all these panels with the reasoning, and the reasons were very good reasons. The apologetics were fine. And I said, well, what Bible were they using? He said, that's what was so funny. They were using the NIV. Now, if you're going to try to teach that the Bible is infallible using the NIV, you struck out on the first pitch. You didn't have to swing the ball, the bat. So it's kind of a, well, it was, it was funny. That is funny. <laughs> if you don't, if you have a, you try to, well, anyway, you get my point. You need to have a Bible. Preach the Word. You've got to have it. But you can have it all day long and never get the profit out of it God put in it for you. God's commandment. And it's an interesting thing. In Romans 16, Paul says, Now to him that's of power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophet, 
made known to all nations for the obedience of faith, listen, according to the commandment of God. It's this program. It's God's word rightly divided that allows you to understand all of God's word, God's way. And I know you say amen to that. I know folks that are watching on the internet that say amen to it. There's some folks out there that say, oh me. It doesn't make any difference what we say. It's what the book says. And when you rest in it, and listen, we're living in a day when the pushback against God's word is not just coming, it is here. Last week, in the U.S. Senate, a hearing published, on, I watched it on C-SPAN, where they're, they're the one of a nomination for, for some cabinet secretary job, un, not secretary, but undersecretary job, Senator from Vermont, Bernie Sanders, was questioning the integrity of the guy standing there, sitting there, because the guy sitting there professed to be a Christian and had written an article in some religious magazine about Jesus Christ being the way, the truth, and the life, and no man coming to the Father but by me, and saying that Christians believe that Jesus Christ is exclusively the way to God. And Bernie came unglued, calling this guy a bigot, hateful, Someone who should be removed from public discourse and never allowed to work in a government position. In fact, he's so vile, he should hardly be allowed to walk the streets. Now, what struck me wasn't so much that Bernie would say that, because he, he's been saying that all his, minutes, all his life. It struck me that not one senator on the dais stopped and said, wait a minute, point of order. We have a long-standing tradition and rule, constitutionally based, that religious tests are not used to determine who serves in public office. Now, Bernie would call that and demand that if it was a Muslim seeking a job. But because it's a Christian, Muslims don't just say they're the exclusive. They cut your head off if you don't agree. Christians just get a little red in the face about it. My point to you there is not to talk about Bernie Sanders. I mean, or uh, there's a candidate for the presidency of one of the national parties who can now stand on the Senate floor and say those things, and it doesn't make a ripple. Because most of the people listening... The under 40 crowd agree with him. The dudes that call millennials, the snowflakes, don't just agree with him. They're demanding it be the case. Now, I'm saying that to you not to decry what's out in the world because what's out there is just the world. But my point to you is that you better be able to be a Bible-believing Christian or when that flood comes in, all this wishy-washy ungodliness that has no spiritual power, puts no spiritual backbone, and you gives you no convictions to stand up and understand how to evaluate those things, when that, when that flood comes in as, a flood, as it is, Isaiah said, the truth has fallen in the streets, and error comes in like a flood, as it is now. See, we live in this little nest of believers and we sit here and we talk about these things and we say, Woo, we, yeah, we all agree with that. You know, everything I've said tonight, probably everybody in this room could have teach it as well as I could. You know the verses, you know verses, you're thinking about all the verses I didn't use that you know I should have. But you step right outside this building into the confusion that's out there. We have people here this morning and it's like a you know, they're hanging on for the, the winds blowing out of them about hurricane rate. And they're trying to learn. They've got people encouraging them in it and sticking with it. But it's new to them. And, you know, we think, well, it's old stuff, not to them. 
and they're brave enough to at least come to a place like this. <laughs> you go to all these so-called mega church. You know, a, there was a mega church, 13,000 people in attendance in Seattle, Washington, where Alex was just last weekend. And two years ago, three years ago, I forget now, this is, this is 2017 now, gosh. A couple of years ago, the pastor that built that church got in some trouble. His staff rebelled against him, not, not, a, not a, a, a sexual problem. He, it was a, 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 one of those things, an anger problem. 1 Timothy 3, one verse, one statement about sexual issues, husband of one wife, repeated passages about anger. And because of his anger problems, they fired him. That happened in August. December the 31st of that year, they closed that ministry down. How do you take a multi million dollar, 13,000 in attendance, not membership that's a phony number, in attendance, and it disappeared in six months or less. Because it was, a, it was an illusion to start with, built on a personality, not built on the depth of truth that you have to have in your soul to swim the tide when the current gets rough. Now, I'm not mad at the guy. I just think it's crazy that anybody, he moved, by the way, he's moved to Phoenix, Arizona and started another church. <laughs> you say, well, how can somebody do that? Because there are airheads out there that just keep following people and it doesn't make any difference. But you know what's going to happen with the next group? It'll be the same kind of thing. Same thing. So where you and I have to be, we, we have to take care of what we can take care of. I used to worry about those things. I, I quit doing that years ago. I realized that all I can do, the body of Christ belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. The body of Christ, Christianity, the body of Christ is not going to be eliminated. People say, oh, it's the death of Christ. No, as long as the Lord wants the body of Christ to stay here and keep going, it'll go. Look at what happened in communist China. The, commun the red, the red tricoms took over. Kicked all the missionaries out. Pastor Stam's brother, John, John and, and Betty Stam, were beheaded, martyred people. And what happened? People said, well, 40, almost 50 years, no Christian testimony. When, the, when China began to open back up, you found out there are over a billion Christians in China. Where are they? Well, they're out where you and I are, in the unregistered, they call it church. They're, and you say, well, how'd that happen? Well, the same way it would happen with you. Mom and dad share the gospel with their children. Mom and dad reach their, their, ki their kids and their grandkids, and they do exactly what you and I. You see, that's what believers, you don't kill believers. You don't kill the body of Christ by killing the organization or putting political pressure on it. You kill the facade. You kill the fake. But you have to have not the form of godliness, but the power of godliness. And where that power of godliness that we read about in Timothy comes from is that message committed to the Apostle Paul. And he left Titus at Crete to set things in order that were wanting, to stop the mouths of people that contradicted it, and to teach that truth with all authority. That's where we're going to be. That's our, our calling, our ministry. And when we do ministry, we have to Keep in mind, we're not ministering 50 years ago. We're not even ministering 10 years ago. We need to look into the future and minister for our family, our friends, our neighbors, what, what's really coming. Now, that's my rant. Sorry about that. But anyway, thank goodness it's over. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace to us, for your word. In Christ's name.